Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files, true stories of encounters with Bigfoot. Wild Men of the Woods, reported sightings from the 1800s. Reports say that in the vicinity of Ellisburg was seen on the 30th by a gentleman of unquestionable veracity, an animal resembling the wild man of the woods. It is stated that he came from the woods within a few rods of this gentleman, that he stood and looked at him, and then took his flight in a direction which gave a perfect view of him for some time. He's described as bending forward when running, hairy, and the heel of the foot narrow, spreading at the toes. Hundreds of persons have been in pursuit for several days, but nothing further is heard or seen of him. The frequent and positive manner in which this story comes induces us to believe it. We wish not to impeach the veracity of this highly favored gentleman, Yet, it is proper that such naturally improbable accounts should be established by the mouth of at least two direct eyewitnesses to entitle them to credit. Twenty years later, in the late 1830s, there were reports of a wild child around Fish Lake in Indiana. Four feet tall and with a covering of chestnut hair, it was often seen among the sand hills near the lake, as well as swimming in the water. It ran very fast and could not be caught, and made awful yelling and whining noises. Also, in the 1830s, but farther east in Pennsylvania, child-sized hairy creatures were seen on at least two occasions, as this report published afterwards in newspapers describes. Something like a year ago, there was considerable talk about a strange animal, said to have been seen in the southwestern part of Bridgewater. Although the individual who described the animal persisted in declaring that he had seen it, and was at first considerably frightened by it, the story was heard and looked upon more as food for the marvelous than having any foundation in fact. He represented the animal as we have it through a third person as having the appearance of a child seven or eight years old, though somewhat slimmer and covered entirely with hair. He saw it while picking berries, walking toward him erect and whistling like a person. After recovering from his fright, he is said to have pursued it, but it ran off with such speed, whistling as it went, that he could not catch it. He said it ran like the devil, and continued to call it after that name. The same or similar-looking animal was seen in Silver Lake Township about two weeks since, by a boy some 16 years old. We had the story from the father of the boy in his absence, and afterward from the boy himself. The boy was sent to work in the backwoods near the New York State Line. He took with him a gun and was told by his father to shoot anything he might see, except persons or cattle. After working a while, he heard some person, a little brother as he supposed, coming toward him whistling quite merrily. It came within a few rods of him and stopped. He said it looked like a human being covered with black hair, about the size of his brother who was six or seven years old. His gun was some little distance off and he was very much frightened. He, however, got his gun and shot at the animal, but trembled so that he could not hold it still. The strange animal, just as the gun went off, stepped behind a tree and then ran off, whistling as before. The father said the boy came home very much frightened, and that a number of times during the afternoon, when thinking about the animal he had seen, he would, to use the man's own words, burst out crying. Apart from their small stature, these wild boys sound exactly like the huge Bigfoot seen today. Perhaps they were young Bigfoot, or a similar but smaller species? The wild man seen in Arkansas during the first half of the 19th century was of gigantic stature. Known since at least 1834 in St. Francis, Green and Poinsett counties, two hunters had a close encounter with it in Green County in 1851. They saw a herd of cattle apparently being chased and watching, they found that the pursuer was an animal bearing the unmistakable likeness of humanity. He was of gigantic stature, the body being covered with hair and the head with long locks that fairly enveloped the neck and shoulders. The wild man, after looking at them deliberately for a short time, turned and ran away with great speed, leaping 12 to 14 feet at a time. His footprints measured 13 inches each. The local explanation for this strange being, an explanation as far-fetched as some of today's, was that he was a survivor of the earthquake disaster which desolated that region in 1811. 
A common factor of these early reports is that the creature is described as a wild man or wild boy, with the implication that the creature was a human being who had taken to the woods and in doing so, somehow developed a thick coat of body hair. In the same decade, the 1850s, gold prospectors in California's Mount Shasta area were seeing Bigfoot. As John Weeks recalled in 1959 after reading an article on Bigfoot, my grandfather prospected for gold in the 1850s throughout the region, described as being the home of the snowman. Upon grandfather's return to the east, he told stories of seeing hairy giants in the vicinity of Mount Shasta. These monsters had long arms but short legs. One of them picked up a 20-foot section of a sluiceway and smashed it to bits against a tree. When Grandfather told us these stories, we didn't believe him at all. Now, after reading your article, it turns out he wasn't as big a liar as we youngsters thought he was. The Bigfoot's habit of destroying equipment and belongings of any white men who have penetrated into its territory, almost as if it resented their presence and wished to frighten them away, is a feature which will reappear in later reports. A story of forest giants told by a hunter named Bauman was recounted at length by Theodore Roosevelt in his book Wilderness Hunter, and the events he described, dated roughly to the mid-19th century, are evidence that Bigfoot, if indeed it was the culprit, can sometimes act violently towards humans. But, since Bauman never actually saw a clearly identifiable Bigfoot, we will give only brief details of the case. Bauman and a fellow trapper were in the mountains near the Wisdom River on the Idaho-Montana border. While away from their camp, something destroyed their lean-to and investigated their belongings. Footprints had been left, showing that the intruder walked on two legs. That night, Bauman awoke and glimpsed a great dark shape, which he fired at. He also smelled a strong odor. The next evening, on returning to camp, the men found their lean-to again destroyed, and they decided next morning to leave the area. They began to collect their traps, and later they split up, Bauman going to fetch the last three traps, his friend returning to their camp. When Bauman got back to camp several hours later, he found it strangely silent. His friend lay dead, his neck broken, and four fang marks in his throat. The footprints of the unknown beast creature printed deep in the soft soil told the whole story. If the following story is to be believed, a creature whose description resembled that of the Bigfoot reported today was actually captured in Arkansas in the second half of the 19th century. The story of a 19th century capture was told by Otto Ernest Rayburn in his 1941 book Ozark Country. According to Rayburn, the giant of the hills was often seen in the Arkansas Washita Mountains. This seven-foot wild man was covered with thick hair and lived in caves or by the Saline River. Everyone was afraid of him, although he does not appear to have harmed anyone. The decision was made to capture him, and the story tells that the men actually succeeded in this. They lassoed him in his cave and took him away to Benton Jail. They also dressed him in clothes, which he tore off before escaping from the small wooden building. He was recaptured, but there the story suddenly ends. Around the same time, the late 1860s, but in Kansas, to the northwest of Arkansas, many of the inhabitants of the Arcadia Valley in Crawford County saw a wild man or gorilla, or what is it? The description which follows could apply equally well to many sightings being made now, nearly 140 years later. Remember that this report of 1869 was made at a time when Bigfoot was unheard of, and so Mr. Trimble's description was unlikely to have been influenced by other sighting reports. Several times it has approached the cabins of the settlers, much to the terror of the women and children, especially if the men happen to be absent working in the fields. In one instance, it approached the house of one of our old citizens, but was driven away with clubs by one of the men. It was so near a resemblance to the human form that the men are unwilling to shoot it, it is difficult to give a description of this wild man or animal. It has a stooping gait, very long arms, with immense hands or claws. It has a hairy face, and those who have been near it describe it as having a most ferocious expression of countenance, generally walks on its hind legs, but sometimes on all fours. The beast, or what is it, is as cowardly as it is ugly, and it is next to impossible to get near enough to obtain a good view of it. 
The settlers, not knowing what to call it, have christened it Old Chef. Since its appearance, our fences are often found down, allowing the stock free range in our cornfields. I suppose Old Chef is only following his inclination, as it may be easier for him to pull them down than to climb over. However, as it is, curses loud and deep are heaped upon its head by the settlers. The settlers are divided in opinions as to whether it belongs to the human family or not. Probably it will be found to be a gorilla or large orangutan that has escaped from some menagerie in the settlements east of here. At one time, over 60 of the citizens turned out to hunt it down, but it escaped, but probably owing to the fright that it received, it kept out of sight for several days, and just as the settlers were congratulating themselves that they were rid of an intolerable nuisance, Old Chef came back again, seemingly as savage as ever. If this meets the eye of any showman who has lost one of his collection of beasts, he may know where to find it. At present, it is the terror of all women and children in the valley. It cannot be caught, and nobody is willing to shoot it. While the inhabitants of the Arcadia Valley were having to put up with the presence of Old Chef around their homes, away to the west in California, a hunter witnessed some unusual Bigfoot behavior, which has rarely been recorded. The hunter from Grayson, California, wrote a long letter to the Antioch Ledger, part of which we now quote. Last fall, I was hunting in the mountains about 20 miles south of here in the vicinity of Oristimba Creek and camped five or six days in one place, as I have done every season for the past 15 years. Several times I returned to camp after a hunt and saw that the ashes and charred sticks from the fireplace had been scattered about. An old hunter notices such things and very soon gets curious to know the cause. Although my bedding and traps and little stores were not disturbed, as I could see, I was anxious to learn who or what it was that so regularly visited my camp, for clearly the half burnt sticks and cinders could not scatter themselves about. I saw no tracks near the camp, as the hard ground covered with leaves would show none. So I started in a circle around the place, and 300 yards off in damp sand, I struck the track of a man's foot, as I supposed, bare and of immense size. Now I was curious, and I resolved to lay for the barefooted visitor. I accordingly took a position on a hillside about 60 or 70 feet from the fire and securely hid in the brush. I waited and watched. Two hours and more I sat there and wondered if the owner of the feet would come again and whether he imagined what an interest he had created in my inquiring mind and finally what possessed him to be prowling about there with no shoes on. The fireplace was on my right and the spot where I saw the track was on my left, hid by the bushes. It was in this direction that my attention was mostly directed, thinking the visitor would appear there, and besides, it was easier to sit and face that way. Suddenly, I was surprised by a shrill whistle, such as boys produce with two fingers under their tongues, and turning quickly, I said, Good God! as I saw the object of my solicitude standing beside my fire, erect and looking suspiciously around. It was the image of a man, but it could not have been human. I was never so benumbed with astonishment before. The creature, whatever it was, stood fully five feet high and disproportionately broad and square at the fore shoulders, with arms of great length. The legs were very short and the body long. The head was small compared with the rest of the creature and appeared to be set upon his shoulders without a neck. The whole body was covered with dark brown and cinnamon-colored hair, quite long on some parts, that on the head standing in a shock and growing close down to the eyes, like a digger Indian's. As he looked, he threw his head back and whistled again, and then stopped and grabbed a stick from the fire. This he swung around until the fire on the end had gone out, when he repeated the maneuver. I was dumb almost, and could only look. Fifteen minutes I sat and watched him as he whistled and scattered my fire about. I could easily have put a bullet through his head, but why should I kill him? Having amused himself, apparently, as he desired with my fire, he started to go, and having gone a short distance, he returned, and was joined by another, a female unmistakably. When both turned and walked past me, within twenty yards of where I sat, and disappeared into the brush. I could not have had a better opportunity for observing them, as they were unconscious of my presence. 
Their only object in visiting my camp seemed to be to amuse themselves with swinging lighted sticks around. I have told this story many times since then, and it often raised an incredulous smile, but I have met one person who has seen the mysterious creatures, and a dozen of whom have come across their tracks at various places between here and Pacheco Pass. Thanks for listening. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.